Hello. Today we're going to talk about the Bohr model of the atom. This model is named after early 20th century physicist Niels Bohr. Here's Niels now. Hi. To get us started on this discussion, let's go in the lab. Here we have a sample of hydrogen gas that's glowing because it's very hot. Now if we zoom in a little, you'll see that it's glowing a pink color. That pink color is really a combination of several different wavelengths of light. And I can see those individual wavelengths by looking through this diffraction grating. When I do, I see a purple line, a turquoise line, a red line. The atoms in the uh, glowing hydrogen are giving off only individual colors or wavelengths of light in what we call an emission spectrum, such as the one you see here. We covered emission spectrums in the module on waves and light, and you might want to review that. Now, each individual line in this spectrum represents photons of one particular energy or wavelength. Notice that the glowing hydrogen doesn't give off a full spectrum of wavelengths, only certain ones. And it was this phenomenon that Niels Bohr was trying to explain. Right, Niels? You bet. Let's look at the essential components now of Bohr's model. And could I suggest that as we go through these, you take notes. Remember, you can hit pause at any point uh, so that you can keep up. First of all, Bohr postulated that the electrons circle the nucleus in circular orbits. Each orbit d uh, corresponds to a unique electron energy. The further out the orbit, the higher the energy. Now what's interesting and unique about Bohr's model is that he said that only certain orbits or energies were allowed. The electron could travel in an orbit, say, this large, and in an orbit, say, this large, but not in an orbit in between. Electrons are free to jump from one orbit to another. And in fact, if an electron jumps from an outer orbit of higher energy to an inner orbit of lower energy, then it releases a photon of exactly the same energy as the difference in energy between those two orbits. So what's Bohr really saying here? Let's take a look at his model. We picture the nucleus at the center of the atom and the electron orbiting the nucleus in a circular orbit. Now notice that we've drawn the nucleus quite a bit bigger than it should be at this scale, otherwise we wouldn't be able to see it. Conceivably, the electron could be orbiting at further out in another circular orbit of higher energy. As you look at this model, it might seem familiar. It looks like the solar system with orbits for the planets. But there's an important difference between the solar system and Bohr's model of the atom. Conceivably, in the solar system, a planet could be orbiting the sun at any radius. But in Bohr's model, electrons are allowed to orbit the nucleus only at certain radii and not others. We don't usually think of gravitational energy behaving like the energy of an electron, but it will be instructive to imagine an artificial situation in which it does. When I'm walking up a ramp, I can be at any elevation I choose. You might say I can be at any gravitational energy I choose with respect to the Earth, depending on the elevation of the ramp. But when I'm walking up steps, I don't have that luxury. I can be on this step for gravitational energy, or I can go up to this step for gravitational energy, but I can't be in between. There's a special name we use to describe this behavior. We say that the energies of the electrons are quantized. And thus this principle falls under the name quantum theory. Now quantum theory typically strikes fear in the hearts of most students, and I guess justifiably so, because the mathematics can be quite daunting. However, the fundamental principle of quantum theory is really very simple. 
It is the idea that some things in nature, like the energies and orbits of electrons, uh, behave as if they can only have certain values and not values in between. Now, we're used to dealing with quantities that are quantized all the time, although we don't use that name. Take money, for example. I could give you two pennies, or I could give you five pennies, but I can't really give you 3.4 pennies. <laughs> money is quantized in that sense. Take grades. Your teacher may give you an A- minus or a B plus in this class. Hopefully you'll get a grade that good. But uh, she probably can't give you a grade in between. At most schools, grades are quantized. Now, speaking of math, we probably ought to take a look at the formula used to describe how these orbits are quantized. Bohr postulated that it was the angular momentum of the electron in its circular orbit that had to have quantized values. And here's how we say that in math. As you can see from the formula, the integral steps Bohr chose had the size Planck's constant h over 2 pi. That's not apple pie, but pi the number. The important part of the formula is n, because n can only have values of whole numbers. We can have a, an angular momentum, which is 1 times h over 2 pi, or 2 times h over 2 pi, and so on but never 1.5 times h over 2 pi. Now, your professor may want to go into more detail than this, but the important point to remember is that the size of the electron orbit and its energy are quantized because n can only have values that are whole numbers. It turns out that the Bohr model of the atom works really well for the hydrogen atom. So let's take a look. We'll start with the nucleus, which has a single positive charge. Hydrogen has one electron to balance the plus one charge of the nucleus. Let's show the orbits now. Here's the first, and here's the second. A byproduct of Bohr's math is that the size of the orbits doesn't increase linearly with the number of the orbit. In fact, it goes up as the square of the number of the orbit. What does this mean? Well, the radius of orbit 2 will not be twice as large as that of orbit 1, but four times as large, because 4 is the square of 2. With this in mind, let me ask you a question. How much bigger do you think the third orbit's radius will be than the first orbit's radius? Let's hit pause and give you a chance to figure that out. Did you get 9 times? Well, 3 squared is 9, so the third orbit should be 9 times further out than the first. Now, the electron is normally found in the lowest, innermost orbit. Notice that we've depicted it much bigger than it would be, otherwise we wouldn't be able to see it. If a photon of light comes by of just the right energy, the electron can jump to the second orbit. This is how the atom absorbs light not just any light, but only light of just the right energy, the energy which exactly matches the difference in energy between orbits. So the electron ends up in a higher than normal orbit, and we say that it's in the excited state. Now the electron, being lazy like the rest of us, doesn't want to stay out there in the excited state. It wants to fall back down to the ground state. The only way it can do this is to throw off some of its energy. And this it does by emitting a photon of light. Not just any photon, but one of exactly the same energy as the difference in energy between the two orbits. Thus, atoms only emit light of certain frequencies or energies, and not others. Notice that it's not the size of the electron orbit that's the focus of attention here, but the energy. Let's take a look. Here's the hydrogen atom, as you saw it on the last slide. Now we're going to represent the energies of the orbits so that we can get a sense of what's going on. To do that, we think of the electron as being in an energy well. Now why do we do this? Well, keep in mind that we're talking about the potential energy between the charged nucleus and the electron. 
It turns out that the math for this kind of system is simplified if we arbitrarily define the potential energy at infinite separation to be zero. That means that as we bring the two objects closer, the potential energy drops and takes on negative values. According to Bohr's model, the electron can't get any closer to the nucleus than orbit 1, so the value of the potential energy will only get just so negative and then stop. Notice that the energy is zero at the top of the well, which corresponds to an orbit number of infinity. Notice that the well is an unusual one, with steps going down every so often. Each step represents the energy of an electron orbit and is labeled orbit 1, n equals 1, orbit 2, n equals 2, and so on. These steps are in keeping with the quantized character of the electron energy. The electron can only choose to be on one of the steps, that is, have energies of only certain values. It can't choose to be just anywhere in the well. The lowest step in the well is the ground state, n equals 1. And this is where the electron likes to be. Notice that the energy is zero at the top of the well, which corresponds to an orbit number of infinity. Now a clarification. The picture on the left shows what Bohr's model depicts the atom to actually be like. The well on the right doesn't represent anything physical, it just shows the relative energies of the electron according to which orbit it's in at the moment. We can cause the electron to jump from orbit 1 to orbit 2 by absorbing a photon of just the right energy. Notice the electron jumps up to orbit 2 in the picture on the left, and it jumps up to the higher energy step in the well on the right. The electron can then fall back down again by emitting an identical photon. Notice something peculiar about the spacing of the energies of the electron as depicted on the right in the well versus the sizes of the orbits on the left. While the orbits get much further apart with orbit number n, the energies of the orbits actually get closer together as n increases. This is another outcome of Bohr's model, and in fact the most useful. The well predicts correctly the energies and wavelengths of photons absorbed and emitted by hydrogen as the electron jumps around. Now let's see what happens when the hydrogen atom is bombarded with photons of different wavelengths or energies. We'll start with the electron in the ground state. Along comes a photon which is not of the right energy to bump the electron up to level 2. So the electron just ignores it. Now along comes a photon of just the right energy. The electron absorbs it and jumps up to level 2. But the electron prefers the ground state, of course, so it falls back down to level 1. As it does so, it releases a photon of light, which is exactly equal to the difference in energy between level 1 and level 2. Now along comes a photon, which is equal in energy to the difference between level 1 and level 3. The electron absorbs that photon and jumps up to level 3. Then it falls back down to level 1, again releasing a photon. Now something like what you just saw happens in the excitation tubes that I showed you in the lab at the beginning of today's lesson. Except that in that case the electron is caused to jump up from the ground state not by a photon, but by crashing into other hydrogen atoms moving at high speed, or by being hit by high energy electrons. The hydrogen electron is knocked up into a higher energy level by jostling with other fast-moving hydrogen atoms. As usual, as soon as it can, it drops back down to the ground state. In doing so, the electron emits a photon of an energy equal to the difference in energy between the two orbits. So when it falls from, say, level 2 to level 1, it gives off a photon of a certain energy. When it falls from level 3 to level 2, it gives off a photon of a different energy. So, if we look at the photons emitted, we see only certain wavelengths, producing an emission spectrum such as the one that you saw. Clearly, Bohr was successful in developing a model which explains the line spectra such as the one you saw at the beginning. 
Each line in the emission spectrum represents one possible jump an electron can make between Bohr orbits. Let's look at that spectrum again. It turns out the first line in the spectrum represents an electron jumping down from n equals 3 to n equals 2. The second represents an electron jumping down from n equals 4 to n equals 2. The third from n equals 5 to n equals 2. And the fourth from n equals 6 to n equals 2. Now we'll show you how to calculate the energies associated with an electron jump from one orbit to another in the next module. So long.